Metroid Prime has aged gracefully, with detailed graphics and a fluid 60 FPS that are still impressive for the GameCube. If you play with Primehack's controls, it's easy to forget that this is a 21-year-old game. Or at least it was until this remaster arrived and ruined it forever. Retro Studios returned for their first release in nine years, giving the game an Ocarina of Time 3D-style overhaul. The source code was ported into a newer engine and otherwise left mostly untouched, so this really is just Metroid Prime with better graphics and controls, which is all it needed to be. The visuals are faithful to the original but more stylized than I expected. It's by no means cartoony, but instead of pure realism, they went for a more abstracted and colorful look, pulling back on texture detail and focusing more on the lighting. If you followed the Aether Labs fan remaster, then you might know that I was contributing a few textures to the project, which is now mostly obsolete. And I'm glad to say it's obsolete, because this remaster has done everything we were trying to do and more. It was surreal to see objects I had just worked on get official upgrades from the studio that originally made them. Sometimes the results were similar, other times assets were completely changed. You can see the clear difference in directions, with simpler and smoother textures in the remaster. On PC, you can do 20 megabyte textures with 4K detail, but the Switch is basically an Xbox 360 Plus and often shows its weakness with texture sizes. So in the same way that the original played to the strengths of the GameCube, carving details into the geometry rather than textures, the remaster is well adapted to the Switch hardware and also avoids relying too much on textures. There are specific rooms where I miss the more complicated look, and people have already made a fuss about the doors looking plain, but this style suits the game and the hardware well. The low-res, low-frame-rate animations on the old beams looked bad in a way that was still kind of cool, but the new fluid ones look like what the effects were always supposed to be. Enemies no longer freeze with an N64 ice effect, and Samus's visor reflection is much more lifelike. The detail of her eyes following the cursor was in the original game, but it was much harder to see. The thing that Prime is best at is immersing you in an alien world that feels like it has history and a functioning ecosystem. The art and music created a kind of sad, introspective nostalgia and a hyper-awareness of the passage of time while playing, and the new lighting enhances that feeling well. The way it interacts with water is the thing that was most consistently impressive to me, and if you want to make the most unflattering comparison for the original, then this is probably it. The physics are also really impressive, and it's just a shame that Mario Wii U isn't alive to see it. God rest his soul. This is up there with Luigi's Mansion 3 as one of the best looking games on the system, but there are some nitpicks with certain effects. Dynamic lighting seems to have been reduced and weapons don't illuminate the world as much. The Morph Ball can still cast light when immediately near surfaces, but the short reach is unnatural compared to the original. There's also a pathetic little reflection effect in the Chozo Ruins that was not recreated, which will result in four full points being deducted from my score. The only real graphics complaint I have is that the new thermal visor is very blurry and low res, which makes it unpleasant to use for more than a few seconds at a time. The old effect in Dolphin is much easier on the eyes. Aside from the visuals, there are also audio enhancements, the most noticeable being acoustics changing in small spaces. The controls are the only major change to the game itself, and the default dual analog option is just about perfect. It has a wealth of customization options, including gyro aim, which is tucked away under the camera tab. I missed that when starting up, so I tried the other schemes and found them very confusing. Pointer can recreate the Wii controls on the right Joy-Con, but not the mouse-like advanced mode that was most popular. It's more like the basic setting, which had a huge dead zone in the middle of the screen, and there's no option to shrink that. Hybrid uses the single stick of GameCube controls, but allows gyro to be used when the R buttons are held. When the gyro is active, the left stick goes from move and look to the modern move and strafe, and that transition is really jarring. I personally didn't find either of these usable. There's also a classic mode for those who want no updates at all. I've been using the Steam Controller and Prime Hack for a long while now, so the bar was set very high, but after some tweaking, the dual analog scheme is about as good. Sticks aren't quite as snappy for camera turns as trackpads, but otherwise it feels very similar, and the sensitivities can go extremely high. I wish they allowed more button remapping, and I had to resort to system settings to change some things, but the option count is already well above average. It's incredibly easy to do platforming and to target enemies. There's some bullet magnetism that sends shots to enemies that aren't in the crosshairs, but it's subtle enough to not notice. The new charge beam stutter is very noticeable though, and it seemed like a strange downgrade to make, until I put the footage side by side and found there's not much actual difference. The power beam now fires three shots before charging, while the wave and plasma beams fire two. Charge time seems to be reduced to compensate, so the actual fire rate of full charges isn't nearly as sluggish as it feels though the wave beam is still slightly worse. 
I assume this was done to reduce the trigger pulls needed for rapid firing. There's also a small retcon to how Samus removes her helmet, made to match up better with the other games. Her face has also been improved. I'm not going to show it, but she looks like Philomena Kunk now. How do you play an orchestra? Do you blow into it, or is it one of those ones where you rub a stick on the string? Otherwise, the actual content seems totally unaltered. I'm sure a speedrunner could correct me with a list of changes, but the updates are extremely restrained. That's good, because Metroid Prime is still a great game. It makes it easy to recommend this as the definitive version, since there's nothing to lose from the original. I do think there were safe opportunities to make minor improvements, though. I found it hard to avoid pushing the right stick in Morph Ball mode. The third-person camera was well made for the time, but there are moments where it screws up, and it would have been nice to gain at least some manual control. The doors require constant beam swapping while exploring, as they often don't match the beam that's best suited to the area. Dropping those barriers after the doors have been opened the first time, leaving them blue, would have made backtracking a lot less annoying. The map could still reflect the original color if you used that to help navigate. Enemies respawn after getting two rooms away, and that also gets extremely annoying when backtracking, with the same Chozo ghosts and jetpack troopers appearing constantly. Keeping at least those enemies dead until leaving the whole sector would help a great deal. The map doesn't record power-up locations, neither for ones collected or ones that have been sighted and scanned. It makes a map that's already fairly complicated to maneuver even more tedious to use, and getting 100% is a chore because of it. I had to watch videos of every single power-up location to track down the two I was missing. I don't think anyone would consider it hand-holding to put a dot where power-ups have been discovered, like Corruption did, or to provide markers, like Dread. Lock-on free aim causes problems with certain objects, most notably a stalactite that seemed impossible to break in the remaster. It took at least 30 missiles from every possible angle before one just worked. I wish the devs had compensated for this by expanding hitboxes when necessary, since this problem dates back to the Wii version. Some of Prime's shortcomings are too deeply ingrained to fix, but I'm already here complaining, so... Samus's mobility is severely compromised compared to the 2D games, and with so many of the classic power-ups focused on that now-forbidden speed, it feels like Prime is missing the usual growth Samus sees throughout the game. That's not to say that there is no growth, just that it's mostly limited to a handful of shortcuts when traveling. The scan visor is a big part of why the world feels so real and lived in, but they went overboard with the number of targets and it slows down the pace of the game. Making the text box larger to display more at one time might have helped get through the really dense terminal clusters. There's a blatant fetch quest at the end of the game, and while it's not as bad as Wind Waker's, it's still a big speed bump to your late game momentum. It takes longer to get around this map than any other modern Metroid, so it behooves you to collect as many artifacts as you can along the way to reduce the backtracking. And finally, the flow through that map isn't always natural. Sometimes you're cleverly led right where you need to go after getting a power-up, but every now and then backtracking feels like a non-sequitur, like they gave up and just posted an objective marker to guide you. Getting yo-yoed from deep in the mines back up to the overworld, and then back to the mines again, is one example. With hints disabled, it would be pretty hard to navigate by intuition alone. For those reasons, I think Super Metroid is the better game, but Prime is a very close second. Retro clung on to Super Metroid as a template. Both games start with a space station escape sequence, followed by a landing on a rainy planet, and halfway through you visit a ship crashed into a lake. The Norfair area is even recreated with the same enemies and soundtrack. Prime succeeds at feeling like a 3D version of Super while somehow not feeling like the same game at all. The 2D action was watered down in exchange for much stronger immersion, making you feel like you really are on this planet and seeing what Samus sees. It's probably the most intensely atmospheric game in the series in that regard, and the remaster only makes that better. It's still a shock to me that this game exists and is on my Switch right now. Maybe even more surprising than its Shadow Drop was the $40 price. Nintendo likely kept it low to build up more of an audience for Prime 4, and it seemed to work, judging by the week the game spent at the top of Amazon's bestseller list. This game feels like a gift. I thought that about Metroid Dread as well. Anytime Nintendo does something with Metroid that isn't some kind of fuck-up, you have to be grateful and celebrate it. If you haven't played it yet, I'll issue the usual buy the game or I'll stab your ass threat. I wish I could say that without any caveats, but there's once again fuckery with the original developers being left out of the credits. It sucks, but it would be pretty extreme to boycott over that. This is a great upgrade to a great game, and at a surprisingly generous price. It gets a 9, if you're into math, or whatever. The rumor was that Prime 2 and 3 would not get the same treatment, instead being more of a Skyward Sword HD type of port. Metroid Prime right. 2 and Metroid Prime 3 are sort of getting... They'll probably get like the updated controls and things like that, but they're not getting quite the same overhaul that Metroid Prime 1 is getting. 
If true, that would be a waste of potential with how much more advanced the artwork was in those games. Maybe if this remaster does well enough, there would still be time for them to reconsider. Who knows? But anyway, you know, I'll stab your ass. Right, today we're talking about Metroid Prime, Nintendo's ill-fated attempt to cash in on the success of the Halo franchise. While the GameCube offered 24 megabytes of RAM, Switch is packing 4 gigabytes, an increase by a factor of 167. Curiously, we do not see the stages growing 167 times larger, as one would expect. Instead, Retro has done something rather clever. They've compressed the amount of graphics that would have existed in that larger world into one the same size as the original. As a result, each graphic in the remaster is worth over 80 standard graphics, a unit we've dubbed a hectographic. Level geometry is not as advanced, and as such we've designated these as decagraphics. And of course, many of these upgrades are simply bespoke features of the new engine, which is, plainly, cheating. So we will divide all results by a factor of 2 as a courtesy to the original game. The result is obvious, and perhaps you're ahead of us on this, but the remaster boasts 87,963 graphics compared to the original's paltry 42. So it's a job well done by Retro Studios then. As always, thanks for watching, subscribe for more, and as for me, I'll be returning to my sensory deprivation plasma recharging chamber to enhance my ocular sensory augments and prepare for the next analysis challenge. Do support on Patreon as this costs a great deal of money.